Hello, I'm Mike Hopkins and welcome to the Point of Leadership podcast. Today is a very special day. Today I'm going to be joined by Barry John, MBE. Barry John, I first met him 10 years ago, just a little over 10 years ago, and he had this idea of starting a charity with his pension from the army. He started the charity, I've worked with him a few times since. He's just a totally amazing guy. When I started thinking about doing these podcasts for you, he came to mind. I thought, I've just got to get a conversation down on tape with Barry John. He's a force of nature. His, his charity is a little unorthodox. It's not your regular kind of charity, if there is such a thing. But he goes about things in a completely different way. He's, um, he's one of those people but if I could invite people alive or dead to a dinner party, he'd be on that list. His charity does amazing work for veterans from the armed forces and for the wider community. It's growing week on week. It's the inspirational part of that organisation. It was his idea after all. And I'm really interested to see his view on leadership and life in general and the third sector, of course, the third sector, the charity sector, is a sector where he spends all his waking hours. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. I hope you get something out of it. And I can't wait for you to meet Barry John, MB, director of the VC Gallery. I like your message about, you know, being kind. Mm. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's the only delivery method that should be used for an organisation that works with people, well, yeah. Yeah, mental health. Because there's no care in care anymore. It's become process. So we miss those opportunities. The doctors never have the time to no. have those meaningful conversations like they used to back in the day, you know. And the mental health workers have only got a certain amount of time to deal with someone. Yeah. And they might have one... Let's see that one person uh, every month mm. for half an hour, for an hour. So how can they install that, that level of kindness instead of process when they've got so much to cover for regards to medication reviews and, you know, looking at where they are on a well-being index, you know, which is not... A well-being index is, is super, super important to be able to look at progress. And if you're focused in on the points to be able to make, then it's all superficial, yeah, you know? Yeah within that time frame, and then to cover meaningful conversations. I think what it also showed is being authentic. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, honesty. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not dressed for... No. And as a charity, you have to be honest. Yeah. Because, you know, everything, everything is super scrutinised. So you can either be a bluffer or you just tell it as it is. And I think that uh, that is the... You, you know, the remains of the day, isn't it? It's like, you have to. You have to just uh, take every opportunity you can to do something. You know. I think it's part of your charm. It's also part of what the VC gallery is. They, they want to go there because it's... I'm guessing, uh, just what I see, they want to go there because they know they're an individual that is recognised there. It's not just another number. Yeah, and that's where maybe the gallery stands at. The, the word uh, as in this uh, PR. Uh, you know, the gallery, you know, artists are quite entrepreneurial, they are quite maverick, they are quite, you know, outside the box, aren't they? So that works really well for that. You know, that you can have the, those disruptors in a sense, you know, mm. listen to them. And everyone has a view. Sometimes it's like three people or four people, in some cases, five people I've had, they're all talking at the same time, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with ideas, and, you know, that, that's when it takes that level of feeling. You know. Equipment to ship, where you can try to capture all of that, to give everyone time to be able to have that word, to be able to give them that sense of being. Thank you for being here today and giving us some of your precious time. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Well, this is the third um, podcast we've done in the Point of Leadership uh, series, and the idea of speaking with you, uh, one of the most inspirational people in my life came to mind fairly early on and so I'm really excited to get your view on, on the world, on leadership and the whole shebang. So uh, by way of introduction, you started the VC Gallery charity 10 years ago, just over? Yeah, just over 10 years now. 
You started it on your pension from leaving the army, is that correct? That's correct, yes. So, yeah, after leaving the forces for 24 years, I wanted to look at how I could come back to my community and to do something different. Um, but ultimately, my military career really focused uh, where I was as an individual, as a personality, um, leaving a small place called Nayland, as you can imagine. It's yes. a very kind of small, kind of tribal area, I would say, yeah. um, and I'm very proud of where I'm from. Yes. So ultimately, in some cases, some of the opportunities were very limited there. I think it was a massive stretch for me to test myself as a young 15 and a half year old to be able to look at joining the forces. I think it was early 90s, there was a lot of redundancies. So I thought, you know, what options have I got? Friends of mine were going into the military. So I thought to myself, I'm going to challenge myself and I'm going to go to the military. There was a second reason. It was because the opportunity to join the forces and to maybe get a post into Hong Kong was one of my motivational factors for it because I was studying martial arts. <sighs> so, so the Royal Regiment of Wales were in Hong Kong. So I thought, right, if I can get a job, I can get off unemployment, I can leave school because I was I was dumb as a mule, you know. I was, like, <laughs> was at the front row, the back door. <laughs> uh, so you know, I had to. I was a slow learner. So I thought that um, that maybe with a bit of sports and, and a bit of a bit of combat um, training, and I was doing karate and I was doing martial arts and I was. Boxing and, and, and fitness was a real key factor. So the infantry, you know, was probably the only thing I could really qualify for right. where I was in my um, my intellect at the time. So um, I, I I managed to get into the Royal Regiment of Wales, which I was chuffed, and uh, and then I had a post in for, for a year. So I was I'm, a, I'm an only child, and um, going into a dorm with like 25 people was super difficult. Yeah. And I was away from home for a whole year, training in Folkestone and Kent. It was like a slam shot into you know, yeah, yeah. beating that anxiety, uh, beating that kind of uh, apprehension of what I wanted to do from a smaller area. That's in at the deep end, isn't it? Totally at the deep end. And I think that's what I always find, I find more beneficial is, is, is going straight in at the deep end. Yeah. And not putting yourself straight under pressure and then trying to mould it from, from that moment on. Rather than walking one step at a time. Yes. Yeah, crisis, total crisis intervention. My wife always says I work better when it's like pressure and it's coming right, you know, what they call ground rush. Did you get to Hong Kong? I went to Hong Kong, yeah. Um, I they, they messed my passport up. I went right. to get on the flight. They said your name is not John Barry, it's Barry John. So I had to leave Heathrow, come all the way back home, yeah. contact the army and say, look, how do, I, how do I do this? And they said, right, the next day I had to get a train or through the day up to Peterborough, have photos and get back home. And then the next day again, go back up and then get on a flight to Hong Kong. Right. So uh, so again, that was a test, you know, and, and now I travel fine. I, I, I love traveling, yeah. you know, some people don't, but. I think travelling is one of the world's most amazing experiences, isn't it? Because that's when you see the world, that's when you see cultures, that's when you learn, yeah. really learn. Oh, without a doubt. I think every step I made, and it's a uh, character building, but also if you if you look at it from a perspective of adventure and of seeing, you know, you go away on holiday for, for a week, I get my best thoughts, I get my best inspirations. You know, I come, you know, because I, I'm soaking in things. And God, I feel nourished. Yeah. I feel like I grow yes. every time, even if it's a, a holiday to Spain or it's going to Malaga and scratching your ass there. I, it's great that you come back. And, and and you just feel like oh I'm I'm ready to go again yeah. until the next time and you know and yeah. it's like if you have those phases um, and I kind of use those phases for what I do um, now for, uh, for other people. So getting into that, the VC gallery is like no other charity that I know. You know, it's quite maverick. Yeah, it's entrepreneurial. Yeah, it's a little bit crazy. Yeah. Do those words resonate? Absolutely. It's like mind on steroids. I think it's, um, yeah, so the VC Gallery is, is, is veterans in the community. Um, we're one of Britain's only charities that incorporate both the civilian side and the armed forces side. And we kind of merge that and then like a decompression. And everyone comes together for the aims of getting better, socializing, having hobbies, and having an engagement based process. So um, it is really important that the kind of mission drift which yeah. I spoke about is something that we look at all the time because yeah. I, I think mission drift is a brilliant opportunity sometimes you think it's a good thing I think it's a great thing 
I love so, it. A lot of leaders like you know Mission Drift uh, shy away. No, no. Tell us about that. Well, as a charity, you've got to be business focused. Yeah. And sometimes the aims and objectives of say the health board or the government or the armed forces can sometimes be malleable and changes. Yeah. So being a veterans and community based mental health charity, if we want to understand better on autism or we want to understand dementia better or we want to understand anxiety we have to we have to mold into that you can't just say we, we're an arts-based charity and that's it because ultimately there's going to be people coming in who don't want to do art they don't want to do poetry they don't want to do photography they might want to do metal detecting they might not want to go on walks they want to do walk in football or they want to, you know, have uh, events going out. So, so we have to kind of mold to the individual that comes in and have meaningful conversations like we're having now and say, OK, what's your interests? You know, you know, and they say, I don't like art. I don't like photography. I don't like that. Well, OK, what do you like or what would you like to do? And if you come up with a, an idea and you're empowered by that idea, we'll work together. So that person is all automatically invested in because I'm listening. I want to learn about this individual and, and, and secondly I want to take that idea forward and ask someone else because we've got so many numbers that come to the mental health charity that there will be someone else that thinks the same as you who might want to do golf or want to do so we'll, we'll, we'll try and that's mission drift in a sense yeah of course it is um, so the primary objective is is social breaking down isolation the arts culture and um, you know, dealing with people's mental health on a on a pure mental side. But if you had to put it into a box uh, of what we do, we tick a lot of boxes. And 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 why I wanted to do that is because it needs to be dynamic. And that mission drift is really is sometimes key. If it's how can you plan when you've got that kind of approach that anything's possible? How can you plan for that? Yeah, we have a skeleton of events that go up, that go on. Um, and then those weekly meetings with, with staff to be able to look at how we can facilitate those conversations we've had with with with, with uh, other referral arms, other people that have come in, a different directive from, from say, the government or, or from the mental health uh, board or from the health board. or So so we have to discuss that and say, well, okay, how we, for the next week or for two weeks' time, how could we incorporate that within our diary, within our skeleton and framework of things that we do every day? That's really agile, I guess. It's totally agile, yeah. And, and that's what's been the, the success of the growth is because we've been able to look at that. And sometimes that mission drift or that kind of level of what we're doing um, that breaks off from the norm sometimes might not work out. Well, that's fine because we've got evidence to say, ah, oh, it didn't really work for now. What was the successes of that? What was the spot around that? And then we'll draw it back and say, okay, that's the no-go here for now. So you really are doing it with people rather than two people. Is that a fair summary? It's a fair summary because you have to know your target audience. And ultimately, it's not about knowing them. We get referred a lot of people from many different arms, from DWP, from probation, uh, hospital leavers, crisis team. So the numbers we have coming in, uh, you know, we have to have those meaningful conversations. It's not about their conditions. It's not about their PTSD, anxiety-based disorders and depression. It's about them as individuals and finding out what was being that key motivator for them in their life before they were ill or before they were depressed. And then, and then, and then bringing that out a little bit and discussing that and then finding new opportunities. I'm sat here listening to you. You're just completely inspirational. Do you feel that? No. No. Never? No. No, no, I think um, because I think if you become complacent and if you, you know, you kind of overthink it, you know, at the end of the day, there's a need. Um, there is a desire to do it. Um, there's a method to do it. And yes, it's, you know, like today, for instance, we've had to, we've had to mold things differently today because of, you know, we are people focused, just like you said, you know, and that came first. I think that's the that's the key factor. The gallery is open five days a week. Yeah. Um, and if I open seven days a week, there would be people in constantly. Whoa. But we have to have that. We have to have that level for the staff to have a break. But ultimately, that that those individuals can 
be self reliant as well on the weekend. So, but on the on a Monday sometimes it's uh, you know it comes in quite quickly, you know, because there's a lot going on over the weekend with lots and lots of referrals over you know 550 people that we support, you know, throughout the four quarters of Pembrokeshire. So um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people in different areas. So why do you run the VC gallery the way you do? It's it enjoys, in, in fact, embraces mission drift, which comes with its own challenges. It's, you know, run very differently. I would imagine you're going against the flow sometimes in terms of the way you operate. And I think it's totally inspirational, mm. let me be clear. But um, have you never thought, well, maybe we need to conform, maybe we need to sort of fall into a stereotype of how a charity looks and operates? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of serious things within dealing with people with mental health yeah. that needs to be considered. And within that conformity, we've got that drug and alcohol work. We've got that pure mentorship. And then we've got the counselling. So those three, and, and, and the tenancy support. So okay. that again, that's part of the skeleton, really. That's the arms and the feet. Yeah. So I think um, the rest of it is, it sounds very loose. But that's, that's where the creativity comes, and I think that's yeah. where the blend is between the skeleton of, of those support arms that need to be there, yeah. and then and then everything else that makes up the flesh, you know, the events. Okay. And it's events-based mental health um, work. So, again, we don't focus on the conditions. The conditions are super important for the individual, yeah. and, the, and, it's in, and for us as carers and for peer mentors or for counsellors. But I think it's about... Finding the finding that human relationship and 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 trust. Without trust, it it means nothing. I can talk to you about a hundred things. If you haven't got the trust there, you won't get that information. Won't seek that information. You won't retain it. But if you've got trust and you've got belief in 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 each other and there's a relationship as that symbiotic relationship, you get that kind of okay. Yeah, I'll take that on board, and I might do that. But ultimately, points make prizes when you're dealing with, with that interaction. And I think that the mental health conditions are super, super um, important to consider. But ultimately, if you've got events-based strategy, so we'll do art, we'll go on that walk, we'll go on that metal detecting, we'll, you know, to go out surfing. Um, and then when we're coming back, if we've, you know, we've done something different or challenging or different temperatures like water, as you know, you, you do a lot, then, then you come back and you, you're kind of, you're, you're, your system and your mind is a little bit different. So that's when those points make prices. That's when you can get the maximized kind of level of input and, and trust and conversation. And the military is like that. You're chucked in this, you know, environment, maybe a combat, envi- you know, environment. Maybe, you know, you're going on a battle run, you know, and you're running and you're, and you're making up these, these teams, you know, and there's someone you, you would look at and you think, I don't like that guy, you know, but ultimately you're in the same position and you're fighting through together. And then you come through it at the end and you're both knackered. You've both been through the same thing. You're both wearing the same stuff. You're both wet. You're both tired. You're both knackered. And then you've got the commonality. Yeah, you know, we've yeah. done something together, so yeah. you can't replace that, you know. And you might not have liked that person initially, but ultimately there's a, a level of trust there um, that has been imposed on you through an events-based opportunity. That makes sense. That makes sense. And actually, when we do something physical, it changes the mental. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Neurons are different, physical component, you know, the oxidization of the body, massive different factors. But I think that... That, that armed forces perspective, you leave that tribal, you know, net mm. combat, brothers, sisters, you know, that, that, that duality, and then you leave the forces and then bang. Nothing. Nothing. You haven't got that, 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 what you've, you've learned and what you've been in, in the environment, you know? Mm. So that's what I mean, that decompression bit is that you come in and we're not tribal, we're controlled tribal because we want people to be proud yeah. of what they've done and achieved yeah. and been yeah. and served, but ultimately they still got to move forward with their life and be a part of the community, you know, to be able to integrate into a community. And some of that, that, that moral compass might not be the same, you know, in the same street, you know, mm-hmm. where someone might not have done the same things, but it's about having that emotional intelligence to understand that they're not the same as you, um, they won't be the same as you, and I can't treat them the same as a soldier or a, a marine or a navy person. You know, this is a different environment. 
but they can still get that environment a little bit in the gallery. Yeah. But it's integration with the community, with people with you know serious uh, learning difficulties or. Um, I've got I've got serious mental health conditions, or, or very physically disabled, or have got autism, um, and 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 we're and with dementia and Alzheimer's, and they're working together, you know, still with that kind of little bit of tribalism that you got from competitive uh, armed forces kind of life, but you know it's slow and slow decompression into the community because that's where they are now. They're not in the forces anymore. I heard it said recently, you know, that when we show care. To someone, that's how we build trust. Do you think that you limit? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess ultimately, what you're doing day in day out is showing care. Yeah, but that's no judgment. That's no judgment. No judgment. You know, besides the referral processes, you can walk in. You know, and 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 op- can make that opportunity. People come in that are professional artists. People come in the sportsmen. They don't come in because they they're suffering from their mental health. They come in because. They want to be a part of a community and to give something, but ultimately, they we are like some in some cases the fifty pound in the wallet they they're not, they're not using, so they're coming in. But if they need us, they they know we're there, and I think that as long as we as a charity are forward leaning into care and to always treating people with respect, no matter what ethnicity, gender whatever, whoever it is, we are a caring and uh, engaging community that brings people together. I think that's, that's, a, that's a real factor. And, and, and beating loneliness. You can be lonely with a condition, you can be lonely with your thought processes, your gender identity, and, and you know, your autism. You can be alone. You can be in a busy room and alone. Yeah. And I really uh, focus in on that. My staff focus in on if you have someone that comes in that is feeling lonely and is in a busy room that built up of different personalities and they're all talking because they know each other but they're at they're a different level of that because they're new then we have to make sure that we guide those conversations and make sure we have that eye contact and make them feel like they're welcome and they're validated as an individual when they come in So you're the leader of the gallery? I'm the founder Yes I wouldn't say I'm the leader Why not? Because we, 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 we've got a really strong team um, last week, I'm going to name draw. Okay, as us, we won NHS uh, uh, Hewilda uh, Team of the Year. Um, so it's not just about me. You no, know, no. it's a, it, you know, and it, you have a whole load of leaders. I think a whole load of people that you can communicate with and trust, and and and, and, and challenge, and they challenge you. Yes, that's, that's good. That's good. If I if I came in there and I, I you know that's not happening. This is where it's happening. You know that's for me that doesn't work in a mental health charity you know in the military we know that's the way the hierarchy yeah the, the hierarchical chain is, is, is what it, it pins performance in a mental health charity uh, no no I mean you know my staff can challenge me you know respectfully and I can challenge them respectfully but I've you know uh, it's built up on you know, I've got my project manager, Steph, who I hugely re- um, uh, work together closely with and respect. Yes. And she is, uh, you know, uh, someone that, um, you know, dealing with an armed forces. She's not armed forces, you see. So that's great continuity between me being a veteran. Yes. To be in the V. Yeah. And her being a community. Yeah, you know, and a strong is. female, you know. Um, she is quite a character. She is. She is. And, you know, and, and that's a great level for me. You know, because I'm the ideas guy, you know, uh, I'm the one that wants to do wacky things. And, you know, yes, I'm the founder, but, you know, I need to be put in my box. Um, and I need to be um, not chauvinist in my approach to that because, or, or egotistical. And that's why he says, you know, you're saying I'm inspirational. I'm trying to do something that I'm passionate about. I think that's the, the key factor. And then she is equally passionate. And then we recruit equally passionate people to want to care yeah. and to want to better other people as them, and themselves of course but but if we can do that as a team um, and be inflexible and uh, making mistakes sometimes okay. and, then, and you know that's really important tell me about it so sometimes I think you know when I wanted to set up the charity the local authority you know wasn't really supportive you wow. know because charities can be your maverick 
Yeah. Charities can do their own thing. They can be flexible. They can take risks where the local authority can't. They have a set parameter of what they need to do. And that's really important. But if there's a hole in services, if there is a niche, and that's where the, that's where a charity or a, a social engagement project or a CIC grow, is that opportunity for, for something not there. Fill the space. Yeah, you fill the space, you know. So you can take risks, and as long as they're controlled, of course. Yes, you know, not reckless. Deal, not reckless. We're, we're dealing with, you know, super important things. Yeah. You know, public money. You know, you've got to make sure that you, you're, you're covering all angles. But ultimately, you still need to test what you're doing to see if it works or not. And that's where the, 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 the drawback, if you make mistakes or you make the wrong thing, as long as you do it without malice and you do it controlled and then you can talk about it and then work it forward, I think that's the key factor. If, if one of my staff makes a small little mistake with, with someone, um, then that automatically the first thing is is to have that face to face, and we're working together here. You know, this is a new thing. You know, we're creating something new every time you go and do something. Yeah, and that brings excitement, excitement, but it also brings a, a massive challenge to that individual. Yeah, of course. Um, because but that's where they grow. That's where they grow. Yeah, without a doubt. And and as long as we're working as a team and they feel supported in that and what they do. Then, then, then fabulous. For instance, one of our staff members thought it would be, you know, beneficial for taking our guys um, surfing, and we had someone that was severely disabled, you know, going onto a surfboard uh, for the first time, never surfed, never a thing, but you know, you know, seventy year old, you know, going surfing for the first time, and that was supported. It was insured correctly, you know, with the right support mechanism, and he was the conduit for that on a personal level while he referred to professionals to make sure these people were safe in water. So 70 was, years of age. Had, had been, uh, lived quite close to the Pembroke Dock VC Gallery, who was completely on her own, had been referred in via a community police officer that thought that they were very, very lonely and had not seen anyone. And they, uh, and they got brought in by the local police and they had a, had a, had a massive relationship with um, the Pembroke Dock um, uh, gallery staff, and and then they, they, that happened, and they went surfing, took part in lots of art exhibitions, um, and had a new lease of life. You know, from from being t- completely isolated as an elderly as an elderly person in in a, in a house. So breaking isolation is is a huge factor. That's incredible, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, could be proud of that. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm proud of the staff. Who facilitated? Made that happen. Made that a lot of people them a life chance. It's something different. A lot of people would be saying no, it's too, too difficult and, and, and risky, and you know, um, there's too many factors in in play. But actually, if you keep it simple, you know, and you look at the factors, and you work with support agencies, that their strengths is all about that, and you buy into that. That's what that's what referral processes are. As long as it's underpinned by a good peer mentor that's having good comms that's making sure everything's safe and everything's consensual you know they want to do it they have they want to have that opportunity even if they didn't say no it happens all the time in the gallery you know we'll have a walk we'll have our gardening project we'll have a dig for victory project but someone doesn't want to do that yeah but they might want to go to poetry so it's having having that opportunity that's safe and structured and, and people are caring while they do it to break down their anxiety. That sense of being in control, I think, is deeply important. The ability to say yes, the ability to say no. Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Can you tell me some poetry? In their tortured eyes, I stand forgiven. Sigrid Sassoon. So he was a First World War um, captain with Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And... Uh, was a regiment that's affiliated to my regiment and it was on the song and seen some tragic things and came back and I love that saying in their tortured eyes I stand forgiven so when you're trying to give the right information to someone you know they've obviously been traumatised and tortured and they're either their mental health condition the way that they got brought up adverse childhood experiences or combat related or it doesn't have to be combat related Mm. someone can be traumatised you know from from a civilian perspective you know multitude of things but um, so so that 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 saying, I love that. Well, 
That resonates with you. Mm. Oh, yeah. In the tortured eyes, I stand forgiven, you know, because you're trying to do the best for them. But sometimes, you know, it might be too much for them. But at least with there as a support mechanism, as a, as a light. I'm mindful of your time. Um, I'm also mindful that people watching this podcast might be thinking, okay, so what's in this for me? Apart from meeting someone who I believe to be totally inspirational. So let's talk a bit about leadership. So, you, you know, you describe yourself as being one of a team. Yeah. So you've got a team of leaders. And that leadership changes given situations, I guess. Yeah, from, from their strengths. Yeah. So, for instance, we've had someone that come through the criminal justice system. Okay. So why should I be making assumptions on how that individual should be treated for that individual scenario? And he would say, look, for my life, for what I've been through, I think we should go this angle. Okay, well, talk, talk to me about that. Talk to me about your experience and how that relates to this experience and how that's beneficial. So that person becomes the subject matter expert on that scenario. Yes, I mean. Yeah, and that, that, that's, that's different. Huh? That changes. I think the, the underpinning factor is just to make sure that we're kind and that kindness is, is, is the only benchmark. You know that that we go from, and then those individuals that could be that momentary leader, they might not consider themselves as leaders, and I don't think that they will, because we have that team ethos. Yeah. Yes, you know, there's decisions to be made by me and staff, and, yeah. but ultimately, I think on scenarios we have to talk about that. So having those that good communication as a team, and that um, what we call a PXR post exercise review or a pre exercise review before we go yeah. um, and do something that's different or um, a scenario and that freedom for that individual to make that decision as well. You've got to get this entrepreneurial spirit to the third sector, to the voluntary sector, to the charitable sector, as well as dipping your toes into business, into healthcare, into finance, you know, into, into networking, into dynamic kind of um, um, growth because you've got to survive. It's a challenging time for a charity. And you have to, and you have to be like a boxer. If you stay static, you're going to get punched. If you get punched when you move in, you've got more of a chance to, to move with it and make a counter offensive. And that's really important. So what keeps you awake at night? Um, funding what works, I think is really, is really, um, it's difficult to attain in the charitable sector. You know, we know what works is that having that baseline of those, that skeleton of, of pure mentorship, you know, um, uh, intensity support, you know, trying crisis intervention, um, and counseling and drug and alcohol services and reduction is all a part of that. But ultimately it's about funding what works. So is making sure that the right people in place are getting funded to be able to continue doing that. So that, that is the major, that is the major kind of headache because, uh, uh, to have a team, you need to be able to pay them right as well and value their contribution. Yeah. Yes, my investment early doors um, was my was my was my take to, to to try it, to try the product to see if it was it was going to work. Yeah. To 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 make it effective in in regards to looking at it and evaluating and think, okay, is it going to work? Is it needed? You know, and now it is needed. It's about funding that need and to keeping that that skeleton because everything just falls off that. And doesn't need to be cost, you know, heavy, you know, to go on for a walk, you know, it mm. doesn't cost anything, mm. you know, but it costs, but to have that pure mentor, make sure he, you know, talks and walks and gets the health and safety and, you know, covers those things, that can be done, but that's part of his job role, you know. Yeah. yeah. So to do an engagement, you know, that that's an engagement. So sometimes I think people look at the third sector and think, maybe, maybe it's just teen sympathy. What do you do on that? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you said that. There's a lot of charities that, um, especially in armed forces, maybe like a, what they call something that really irritates me, called brew and banter. Brew and banter. Brew and banter, yeah. I, I You know, I, I don't like that. Sounds like bullshit. I, I don't like that. It's not, you know, for me. You know, we've got, yeah, you know, is the brew the word for, for, for welcoming, maybe? Banter is a way for, you know, understanding. Or for, for bringing people together um, and to, to have a, a laugh, because that's what you do in the military. It's a lot of dark humour, isn't it? But ultimately, for me, um, it's about being acceptive of everyone in, in the room, no matter where they've served or they haven't served 
or they come in with a, you know, a mental health condition. Um, and I think, you know, going back to that, it's, it's just about, we want to be a charity that, um, is as close as, as close as to the professional lines as possible, but ultimately still really, really focused on, on innovation, you know, and, and, and moving with it, yeah, moving yeah. with things. And that's where that mission drift thing comes in. I don't mean to be derogatory about that. It's about how, how I can be flexible because sometimes you've got to survive. So, so, so if the Welsh government say, right, we're interested in looking at loneliness this year, then ultimately we have to focus that, but keep it to our core objectives, our skeleton. Because that underpins a lot of things. Mm. Or if it's about harm reduction, or it's about gambling, or it's about dealing with uh, people you know that have come from a criminal background, you know. So we have to. That's where I'm, that's where the stir needs to be. You know what I mean? For that moment. I get it. I get it. <clears throat> but underpinning our core objectives, which is keeping the doors open, yeah, being welcoming, having these engagements that are cost effective. I mean, the mobile museum, for instance, Mike. You know that costs nothing. You know, we can go and deploy uh, into care homes, into schools, into colleges, into GP surgeries. And these are tables full of just artefacts from people's lives that they, the, the, the volunteers behind this talk about. You know, this is my life. This is where I've been. You know, I'm I showing know, you this. I didn't know about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, really cool project. It, break, it breaks anxiety big time, you know, uh, because some people walk into a room and if they've got to go like over here and go poetry or go over there and, and do, um, uh, talk to people or got to communicate, sometimes they that, you know, sometimes their anxiety is so crippling that eye contact is hard enough. Walking into a building is hard enough. So if there's a walking into a building and you can go and look at artifacts on a table, like you would in a museum, yeah. you don't have to engage. And, you know, again, it goes back to what they want to do. If they want to look at these things, then brilliant, you know. And then we can maybe say, hey, how are you doing? You know, do you want a cup of coffee? Oh, no, thanks. No problems. But yeah. I guess looking at the thing takes the focus away from the person. It takes and it gives you, a central you, thing to... Yeah, what I call spider, the spider web. You know, in the gallery, it's about looking at artworks on the wall. So you go to one and then go to another and the spider web, and then you're in the middle of the gallery. Yeah. And then you have someone then to come up and say, hey, how are you doing? You okay? Do you want, can I, do you want a coffee? Do you want to hear about what we do here? You know, they might... They might want to engage, they might not want to. But ultimately, if you if you can do that around an event, then that's what that event's based. But the volunteers doing that, they get empowered because they're talking about their artifacts, their life, you know, their interest in past. And it could be something from the Roman times that have been found, you know, on, a, on, a, on the, the, the Dig for Victory project. So we talk about that then. So, oh, yeah, that's found on a Dig for Victory project. Oh, I've always wanted to get into metal detecting. Oh, do you know that? Well, uh, next week now, in fact, as we speak now, We've got guys metal detected. We've got guys on a poetry. You know, we've got guys doing the peer mentoring. We've got guys doing a, a, a choir or they don't like that jams group. So, <laughs> but ultimately that little coin, you've started to do a narrative, you know, from that, that they can do for an engagement to be able to do something. Do you ever get tired? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a professional artist as well, remember? Yeah. So, so, you know, I have to remember that. I've got a career as well, um, as well as running a charity. So, you know, I'm very passionate about that. Don't get as much time as a professional artist would. I was speaking about that with, uh, with your wife and your staff just now yeah. about, um, it's like a, a miracle I get any artwork done as a professional artist, but you know. I've never seen you be tired. I've never seen you more, you know, any less than a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think we all have to put masks on as well. It's really important in performance, isn't it? A method actor needs to become something that like you say about leadership, but sometimes you might not be up for it. But ultimately, you have to show that inner strength. And by doing it, sometimes you just come into focus and then you just take it off. And then, you know, halfway through that, then you're back in the game. Yeah. You know, you're back in the game. You've convinced yourself that it's okay. Yeah. You've convinced yourself you're tired because you didn't sleep very well because you were worried about finances or whatever. But ultimately, if you show that to your staff, you know, that that performance level is, everyone's like that then, you know. So it's not about having that. So if I had your talent in art, which I don't, I don't know. I can assure you, I don't know. I don't know. It's, you're very generous, but I don't. What could I do to replicate some of your being? What's a practical thing I could do to have the same impact 
that you have on people around you, day in, day out, week in, week out? Meaningful conversations with someone. So if you're doing something, as you know, I've just seen you've got a piece of art by Josh Weatherman here, who's autistic, young man, puts the pen on the paper yeah. and doesn't leave until the character is mm-hmm. done. He's got another show in April, you're invited okay. to it. I'll let you know. So, um, so if you're doing that, then you talk about that to someone else. You show your, you show what you're doing. You show your passion. And you hope that passion is, you know, it's interesting. And if it's not interesting to someone, then maybe something other art form is or other poetry is or that's where that is that communication between two people. It's just very, very basic. It's like, you've got a passion. You're talking about that passion. There's someone that might not have a passion at that time. Or they might want to look at a passion or they might want a hobby. We usually find that some people are really depressed, have really lost all that. No so, purpose. So purpose is a really key. And, and, and then anxiety kicks in because you've lost confidence in yourself. Then, you know, then there's this bit of a spiral. It's about then you're saying that, you're like, oh, this is what I do. You know, it's okay that you don't do it. But this is what I do. Mike Hopkins does this painting. You know, and I want to talk to you about it. And I, I'm really passionate about this. I think, oh, okay, brilliant. I'd like to do that. Well, okay. Well, we've got a workshop, you know, going on in a week. Do you want to come? Can I put your name down? Do you want to go to it? Can I talk to you about it a little bit more? Would you like to speak to one of our artists? Would you like to speak to our peer mentor? Would you like to? And then, then that, then that focus, uh, that, that forecast then of, of events comes in. I like that idea. So meaningful conversation. Good comms, meaningful trust, you know, no objective, you know, no ego, just, you know, a good conversation and, and really having a passion, you know, and then creating these little opportunities, micro hobbies for them to try, you know, so they're trying something new, they're opening up their, their, their neurons to different skills. You've been an inspiration, even though you don't know it, but thank you for your time today. Jeremy, thanks, man.